physiology and change. So why, why do we care about oxygen? Just most of you probably know this, but with uh, climate, with warming, we expect the ocean to lose oxygen because of thermal and ventilation changes. And this has impacts for ecosystems, their physiology, uh, the fishing resources, and also it has a feedback uh, on the climate uh, because of the production, like low oxygen zone produce uh, NO2, and they also, they could prevent, like limit the biological pump and essentially increasing uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere through feedback. So that's one of the, like, uh, motivation for studying oxygen and, and, and changes in variability. So the Indian Ocean, as we saw, is uh, hosting one of uh, the major, uh, one of the two major oxygen minimum zones. And this paper from Matt Long recently uh, from an ensemble of uh, climate models say that the anthropogenically forced trend in oxygen in this basin should already be evident in part of it at least. And so I'm going to show you uh, what I've gathered some observations that are available uh, today. And you have here in the Arabian Sea some, uh, so a, a paper by Carl showing very uh, disparate trends with like the, the south a decrease of oxygen and the, the north more of an increase. Uh, in, the, in this area here, uh, that recent paper showed a weak, very weak uh, decrease. It's not clear if it's very significant. Uh, that area here, so that's the famous Strama paper about uh, deoxygenation, um, showed no trend in the Indian Ocean, unlike the other basin. Like we have strong uh, trends in the Atlantic and the Pacific. But the Indian Ocean, it seems like there is no evident trend. And here, that section where we have the Wos and Go ship uh, section, and that uh, recent paper also showed no significant trend in the ventilation uh, this time. So what I'm going to try to do today is to look at why these trends in ventilation and oxygen are difficult to detect. And what can we learn on those processes looking at the variability? And I'm going to look like a large range of uh, scales. I'm going to start with like multi-millennia time scales with the last glacial maximum and go to like, sub, uh, like seasonal and, and mesoscale uh, uh, scales. So I'm going to start before to, because that's something that's going to come again and again in my talk, is we usually to look at the processes in oxygen, we usually uh, decompose oxygen. So that's the oxygen that's a, a slice, I mean, that's a, um, over the Indian Ocean in the data with the oxygen minimum zone here in the north. And this is like uh, Antarctic bottom waters ventilating here, like mode waters here. And we, we have a thermal component, which is what the oxygen would look like if it was only solubility driven. Like. And then, the difference is what we call apparent uh, oxygen utili utilization. It's what it looks like the, the biology has consumed uh, between that state and what it actually looks like. So it includes biology, but also how the circulation transport those gradients created by biology. And you see that the, what we observe is mostly driven by those biological and ventilation, uh, the, that component. Okay. Now, I'm going to start to the very long time scale and look at the change in oxygen that was observed. I mean, we have proxies that show between the less glacial maximum and the warming to the Holocene. So for, these are proxies here, and you see that in the south you have mostly an increase in oxygen, so more ventilation here. And in the north, most of the points are blue, so they are also... Uh, it's a qualitative change. So there are also some spots that increase, but mostly it's a decrease in oxygen between what was the glaciation and what we see today. So the oxygen minimum zone was strengthened during that warming. And recently, uh, we published a paper looking at this change uh, with a, a, a climate model, and that shows the change in oxygen between the last glacial maximum and the Holocene. So I'm sorry, but the it's really the opposite in terms of colors. Like one is uh, increasing in red here, and here it's a decrease in red. But so we really see a decrease in oxygen in the zone of the oxygen minimum zone during the warming. And if we decompose in thermal and ventilation, the AOU biology and ventilation here, we see that we have a 
a warming, so less oxygen due to the temperature change. But you see that the, most of this pattern that we see here is due to that uh, contribution. And actually, in control, you have the, the age of the water. And so it's a ventilation change and not biology that is driving that strengthening of the oxygen minimum zone. With lower ventilation here, where the OMZ is now, and higher ventilation uh, in, in the deeper ocean. So the ventilation control uh, the change in the OMZ, but you see that the thermal component actually reinforced that ventilation component. And I'm going to show that it's very different with what we observe now during the warming that we have today, the anthropogenically driven uh, uh, warming. So if we look at what's going on now, and using here 10, uh, a suite of 10 our system models, and that's the business as usual uh, scenario, and that's the change over a century, and that's in subsurface. So here we're looking at a map, and that's the change in oxygen, and you see where it's steepled, it's where this trend is significant, it's, well, where it's robust across models, meaning eight models out of 10 agree on the sign of change. So what you see, you have regions where they do agree on the sign, but you have a lot of regions, including all the northern Indian Ocean, this uh, ventilation region, and here, where they don't agree on the sign of change. And if we look at the decomposition into thermal and the biological and ventilation change, the first thing is that if you decompose like this, you see that the model agree on each of the contribution much more than they agree on the sum, meaning they all agree on the thermal component and they agree, except the Arabian Sea, but for example, the Bay of Bengal, they agree on the sign also. You, the other thing that you see is that it's, again, it's the ventilation change that drives that pattern that we see in the models. And finally, what our point here is that although these changes are, are, are robust, the thermal change and the AOU change, it's not robust everywhere, but it's robust in, in, in more areas, when you sum them up, because they compensate, they partly compensate each other, they actually end up in a subtle balance that is really hard to get. And some of the models are going to have less oxygen, some are going to have more, but it's because those two terms compensate each other, and it makes it really hard to, to find a trend that is robust across the models. And I think that might explain some of, even all the biases that those models have, that might explain some of the difficulty that we have to detect trends with our observation today, because those two, those two compensate each other. So that's on like multi-decadal to centennial time scales. But obviously there is also on top of this, the variability that we have at uh, shorter time scales. And I'm going to illustrate some of this. Uh, I'm going to start here. So it's uh, Enwi Liao who did his PhD. Uh, so he, he worked on this during his PhD. And he showed, <coughs> this is the first a map of the trend of the ocean heat content in the first 700 meters between 2003 and, and 2012. And you see that you have a strong accumulation of heat in that part of the basin here. That's where that section is that I showed earlier. And he reproduces this in a, in a model, a CSM model. And he looked at why caused that pattern that is reproduced by the model here. And he showed that it's an increase in the, in the heat transport through the Indonesian through flow and an anomaly in the southern equatorial current here. You have that convergence of heat here. And I think that actually might explain the mixed signal that we're seeing here on that section, because those decadal changes in, 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 in the heat transport, so it's the ventilation, so here I'm not showing oxygen, but obviously the both are linked, um, might like all be on top of those trends and make them almost impossible to detect from those sections because you, you have that, this variability uh, on top of it. I'd like also to show another, so this was more on decadal time scale, and on the interannual time scales, I'd like to show that study by Parvati, she did her PhD on this also, and so here she looked at, this is a map of the correlation between the oxycline, 
So oxycline is like the, the level between well oxygenated waters and low oxygen waters. And <clears throat> she showed a strong correlation between the oxycline and the thermocline. Meaning when the, when the thermocline comes up in the Arabian Sea, the oxycline comes up also. So we have a strong uh, modulation of the oxycline by the physical processes. So this is the, in the observation and this is in the model that she developed, the regional uh, model. And she focused more on that region along the Indian Ocean because that's where uh, coastal anoxia, uh, anoxia has been observed. So why is it important? Because when you have those coastal areas that become very depleted in oxygen that has strong impact on, 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 the, on the ecosystems and, and NACV uh, reported like fish uh, kills, I mean associated with those, uh, with those events. And so she, she looked at this area and looked how those coastal anoxia events were um, influenced by interannual variability. And what she shows, so here you have the oxycline depth anomaly in that box, in the model, as a seasonal, the seasonal cycle of that oxycline. And so you see that it goes, uh, the oxycline goes down mostly, uh, and, sorry, and here she, she separated between negative IODs, so the Indian Ocean Dipole, and positive Indian Ocean Dipole. And what she, she showed is that during positive IODs, you have a deeper oxycline in that region, meaning you have more oxygenated waters over a, 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 larger, uh, um, a, a larger depth range. And she, uh, in the model, it's, it's related to those uh, anomalous coastal Kelvin waves that force a downwelling in the, in the area. And so, actually, it's consistent with... Uh, observed anoxic events that only happen, so these are the years, and in blue you have those that are negative IODs, and in black you have those years where it's neither negative or neither positive. And you see that none of the events that were recorded were during positive IODs, and that's because during positive IODs you have this thicker depth of oxygen, and those anoxic events cannot like, develop. So the, the, the internal variability actually preconditions those uh, events. So that's another source of variability in the oxygen, uh, interannual variability. And then I'm going to also show, so at those, if you go even at the smaller scale, the, most of the models that I showed before were Earth system models, so very coarse models. Then the two regional studies were what we call AD permitting uh, models, so quarter of a degree models. However, here you have the um, sea level anomaly like from the observation. Here you have what it looks like in a quarter of a degree model. So we're missing all the eddies that are happening here in the north. And this is uh, in a twelfth of a degree, so kind of starting an eddying uh, model. And so I'm going to look a little bit at, at what, it, what is the impact of those scales that are not in those climate models or regional models. And we can, here I'm going to separate the change in oxygen as a sum of the biological changes and the circulation changes, and I'm going to look at the impact of mesoscale from those two, on those two contributions. So what is the impact of mesoscale on, first, the biology, when one of the impact is the nutrient supply? And Amala was... Uh, uh, talking about this earlier. So how is that impacting the nutrient supply? And this is the impact of the mean circulation and the eddies in that eddying uh, model uh, on the nutrient supply. Where you have red, it means more nutrient supply. And so you see that the mean circulation mostly bring nutrients in the three upwelling regions uh, and where the, the, the boundary current is by transport. While the eddies and the filaments, they export that nutrients in here offshore that upwelling system. And what they also do is by vertical transport, like vertical uh, um, transport in that area, that's the vertical transport, and they actually sustain five, uh, 50 to 70 percent of the nutrient supply to the, to the, upper, to the, to the surface waters. 
So actually in that area, that's the, the mesoscale that sustained the biological production. Now if we look at the circulation, how the ventilation circulation changes the oxygen, so the oxygen supply, yeah, I forgot to say that biology consume mostly oxygen and, and ventilation mostly supply. That's why the biological product, uh, contribution is blue and uh, the, the circulation is red because it supplies oxygen. And so if we look at, the, again, the mean circulation, what it does is that it brings oxygen from uh, by the, the western boundary current. So here where you have the red, it's mostly a transport, lateral transport through the summary current and the western boundary current. Whereas what the eddies and filaments do is that, again, they transport that oxygen offshore. And also here, the vertical velocity transport oxygen that is at the surface and brings it deeper uh, in the water column. And so if we take those two impacts together, let me try to uh, sum up. Basically, what the eddies do is that they decouple the circulation supply from the biological consumption. And so in the mean circulation, what is in coarse resolution models, you have, you bring nutrients to the western boundary current and you have consumption of oxygen in those same area because of biological production. If you have eddies and filaments, you bring nutrients offshore and you also bring oxygen, so they tend to compensate. However, the vertical contribution, what it does is that you bring nutrients here and so you have biological production in this area that is stronger, but you only bring oxygen in that area. So you have that east and west, that east-west contrast between the role of eddies on oxygen. They, they consume, eddies will tend to have an effect that consume oxygen on that side of the basin and bring oxygen on that side of the basin. And so they decouple uh, the, the, the supply and, 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 and consumption of oxygen. So, I was very fast in mind, but that's okay. <laughs> so, I was, um, some of the conclusions uh, I would like to, to make. So, first, the ventilation controls what I try to show at all time scales from the multimillennial time scales to the really short uh, on monthly time scale. The ventilation actually controls the oxygen changes and the variability. Uh, there is no significant trend in observation in oxygen, and there is some disagreement across models for the projections. And actually, I think one of the reasons is that the robust thermal and ventilation contribution, uh, the, the, the thermal and, 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 and ventilation contribution are more robust, but they are opposed, and so they, they lead to that very subtle uh, balance that is hard to get and in, an uncertain trend. The second point is that a lot of variability on all time scales, again, like decadal, interannual, multi-decadal, is obscuring those trends that we are trying to find. And finally, in those models, there are key processes like mesoscale, but obviously sub-mesoscale, uh, that are missing. Um, and also, these scales, they are not just missing from those models, they are also making it difficult to sample those trends because they add some variability to the field and it's really hard to go at sea and to get a, a, a good sense of what's going on when it's very variable, especially. And that's it. So in, every time I said the ventilation drives the response in the model, we do, because we have the ventilation age. And actually, that's what I show uh, here. This indeed blends together biology and ventilation, but the contour is the ventilation age. So here it's an older age, and here it's a younger age. So you increase ventilation here and you decrease ventilation here. So in the model, we have a way of saying. In the observation, it's, it's, it's harder, obviously. Um, I, I think on the time scales of the observation, it would be really hard to see some trends from the biology. I mean, that's my, 
my, uh, my feeling. Because ventilation changes are much more efficient at changing oxygen. The gradients in oxygen are so large that as soon as you change the circulation in the ventilation, it ends up in very strong differences. However, I, I like to stress that those gradients come from the biology. So if there was no biology, there would be no gradients to transport. So obviously biology is very important. In terms of uh, surface biological response, uh, what is important? Is it also uh, is it the mixing or horizontal transport? So for the what, biological response, yeah, in the you mean in the in Arabian the central sea? Indian Ocean, uh, in the north, uh, in the in the Arabian Sea. Yes. So for the biological response here, um, it's both. In the central Arabian Sea, these arrows are here to. Uh, mean like horizontal transport. So you have eddies and filaments, actually filaments between eddies transport a nutrient offshore like 1,000, 2,000 kilometers offshore here. But here it's really, so this is happening mostly during summer, actually. Whereas this is mostly a signature of the winter uh, um, bloom where you have all those eddies that Amala showed, that nice uh, NASA uh, Modi's picture. And you see all those small structures that are associated with vertical velocities, and this is what brings actually nutrients here. So there, I showed here an annual mean, but it's actually decoupled in time also. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so could you tell us a little more about uh, data coverage of the oxygen plots that you're showing? Uh, you mean... Uh, in the, in the past, I mean, how much of confidence do we have in those plots in terms of data coverage? W what plots? This one? You Oxygen. Mean? Or this one? Or what? which one? In general. I mean, okay. how much of Indian Ocean? So oxygen is, what is the biogeochemical tracer that is the most widely measured. So compared to other things in biogeochemistry, we have actually a pretty good coverage, yeah. especially in the first... Uh, 500, 700 meters. However, what's probably lacking is the temporal uh, sampling. So I think this picture is pretty robust. Uh, however, well, I, I'm not going to talk about this I one. Mean, I mean, <laughs> if, I, if I had to put an error map on that blue that you just showed, how will it look? What so what, what that, picture? That, that picture that you just showed with two blues in both Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. Okay, can you go back? Okay, and yeah, that yeah. one. Okay. So those blues, yes. if I had to put some error field, so I think how will that look? So the, I think there are people in the audience that are much more uh, aware of this, but I think the errors are, are on the mean state are pretty low. Okay. Okay. The variability is something else, and that's the problem. The change, the long time change, and the variability, that's, that's a problem. But for the mean state, I think we have a pretty, especially the Arabian Sea is extensively sampled by the Indian centers. And Thank you. Uh, so, one thing that struck me is if you look at, if you define the OMZ, say, in the Arabian Sea by, say, nitrite, um, the boundaries haven't really changed all that much. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a rather irregular shape um, with boundaries that, you know, some people like Tim Rickson would argue it might have moved to the west a little or maybe not. But I would have thought with eddies sort of being responsible for the supply of nutrients like all the way and oxygen part of the way, that there'd be a lot more variability in the boundaries of the oxygen minimum zone in the Arabian Sea. Then, and yet that's not the case. It seems like there's some other underlying well, factors that are controlling the boundaries other than so these eddies, random eddies. Eddies bring nutrients and oxygen, but they impact the mean state. So what I showed is actually the eddy impact on the mean state. 
So what I showed is not that they are introducing variability in that oxygen minimum zone. They are actually essential to get the oxygen minimum zone mean state. It's more if you don't have them, you can't, in the models, have an oxygen minimum zone that look like the pretty steady state that we see.